Benjamin Franklin once said, Nothing is certain except death and taxes. If he were alive in the 1990s, he'd have also included yearly Mega Man sequels. Mega Man 6 is the last of the second NES trilogy of Mega Man games, and it does bring more originality than Mega Man 5. In fact, if you ask me, it's the best of the second trilogy. Even so, Capcom apparently had no faith in this one, choosing not even to release Mega Man 6 outside of Japan. It was thanks to Nintendo of America that the title was published here at all, and Europe didn't get it until a frickin' 3DS virtual console. Mega Man 6 is pretty much just as unremarkable and copy-paste as the two previous entries, to the point where there have been several rumors of it just being a heavy edit of Mega Man 5. The menu graphics and interface have been noticeably overhauled, though, and the Rush adapters were added, allowing Mega Man to combine with Rush for either vertical mobility or increased damage output. But all in all, they're really just different tools for the same obstacle course. Beat returns too, which is fine, he's still a good bird. And unlocking him this time involves finding alternative boss doors in specific levels, which are usually hidden and or harder to reach. The levels are alright, the music is good, bosses are as expected at this point. Is this starting to sound familiar yet? Speaking of bosses, I couldn't help but notice that the robot masters in this one feel a bit... rehashy? The weapons are mostly good, but when you stop to think about it, that's kind of because they just reused all the best weapons from previous games. And Capcom has also long dropped any pretenses of in-game lore when it comes to these robots. Flame Man, Blizzard Man, and Plant Man are all concepts that have been used before, with Plant Man and his weapon just blatantly being Wood Man again. Centaur Flash is just Flash Man's weapon again, meaning it's effective against the one robot master that's weak to it and nothing else. Silver Tomahawk, though, is an excellent weapon with great damage, good range, and low ammo usage, but it's not as broken as the Metal Blade. The Tomahawk and many other weapons can also bypass shielded enemies, of which there are a lot in this entry. Combined with the power adapter and beat, Mega Man 6 really does let you go wild with whatever weapons you want, which is a welcome change of pace. So as well as Nintendo of America being responsible for bringing the game to the US at all, Nintendo Power was also responsible for two Robot Masters designed by people outside of Japan. Nightman and Windman both originated in America, and as such, the North American box art prominently features them, which is honestly kinda cool. Mega Man 6 also seemed to be easier than the other games in general. Maybe it was just me, maybe the Stockholm Syndrome has finally kicked in and I'm just not awful at these games anymore, but bosses seemed like complete cakewalks as long as you were using their correct weaknesses. The game was also a fair bit more generous with providing E-Tanks. I noticed that every Wily level had at least one. The new Energy Balancer also automatically allocates any weapon ammo you pick up to the weapon most in need of it, with no need to switch to the favored weapon beforehand, and... I don't know, seems a bit odd to me to have an optional collectible perform a function that really should have been made standard like four games ago, but hey, what do I know? These last few Mega Man games have honestly been so repetitive that even my reviews have essentially started being the same. But yes, despite some impressive weapon variety and interesting world building, namely that civilization at a global scale does still exist and that people other than Doctors Light, Wily, and Cossack can make robots, Mega Man 6 still feels unnecessary. I'm almost disappointed these games weren't unplayable wrecks, because at least that would be something to talk about. But right around the corner, Mega Man would see a new entry that would forever change the future course of the franchise. Mega Man was struggling at this point. It wasn't subtle. The last three games had been serviceable but uninspired, released on an aging and outdated system. The blatant copy-paste habits of the main entries were hard to ignore. And we also haven't even touched on the Game Boy Mega Mans, which were literally condensed and rearranged versions of the NES games. Keiji Inafune was still the series' lead artist and planner, but with their latest entry, the team focused on making something different. A complete reboot of the series that would allow for making real, substantial changes to the Mega Man formula, with more of a focus on story and world building. And what they ended up creating was a true revitalization of a long stagnant series. Mega Man X was released on December 17, 1993. 
six years to the day from the release of the original Mega Man. And yeah, it's pronounced X, not 10, but it sure confused people, many wondering when Mega Man 7, 8, and 9 had released. We just got number 6 a few months ago. Mega Man X takes place around 100 years after the classic Mega Man games, with the final creation of the late Dr. Light, the titular Mega Man X, awakening from a stasis intended to make sure the fully sentient and free-thinking robot would indeed only be a force for good. And before you even get to the title screen, the game's intro is masterfully understated. It's moody, it's intriguing, it's mysterious. It really makes you feel like you've discovered Dr. Light's old computer yourself. In this distant future, Dr. Light's work has been reverse-engineered by one Dr. Kane, who has used this technology to create his own replica androids, or reploids, several of which end up using their free will to commit acts of violence. Exactly what Dr. Light feared would happen to X. And these rogue reploids would be branded as Mavericks. As such, a group of reploids known as Maverick Hunters would rise up to rein in these rogue robots, led by Dr. Kane's greatest creation named Sigma. However, upon discovery of a red maverick sealed away in a capsule very similar to X's, a mysterious reploid virus would soon begin to spread, changing more and more of the robots into mavericks through malfunction. Unfortunately, Sigma himself would contract the virus, making him the most powerful maverick yet seen. Sigma would go on to lead a massive reploid rebellion, and the red maverick, known only as Zero, would choose to head the maverick hunters in his place. Our hero X, normally a staunch pacifist, chooses in these desperate times to join forces with Zero in order to subdue the Mavericks and storm Sigma's fortress, facing off against the evil robot Vile in the process, who we totally promise is not just a purple Boba Fett. Zero was originally designed by KG and Afune with the intent to be the new Mega Man, but he and the team feared the character might be too radical a departure, and fearing fan backlash, they designed the more traditional-looking X as well. But it seems like the team didn't really have much to worry about, because Zero would prove to be a very popular character, even receiving his own spin-off series in the future. At a fundamental level, the core gameplay loop in Mega Man X is the same. You still run, jump, and shoot through eight levels, each guarded by a boss that gives you a special weapon that is effective against another one of the bosses. But significant additions and upgrades have been made. And the first is that there is now an opening stage before the core eight stages. And let me tell you, this is one of the best choices the team at Capcom made, to the point where it's even adopted by the classic series after this. Everything is crafted to teach you what to do and let you figure things out without explicitly telling you how to play the game. Discoveries are made organically and stick with the player that much more as a result. Look, we've all seen the sequelitis video, so I won't paraphrase it here. Just know that it's really great game design. The game has also been crafted around an entirely overhauled moveset for X, and this did the game designers a lot of favors. Like, in the classic games, the charge shot always felt sort of out of place, but here the game is clearly built with it in mind. In fact, once you achieve the Buster upgrade, you can even charge your special weapons for additional effects, such as the Rolling Shield's Barrier or Chameleon Sting's Cloak, which grants you temporary intangibility. Mega Man can cling to walls and jump from them to gain additional height, and these can even be chained together, making both basic traversal and dodging enemy attacks much more dynamic. Upon acquiring the Leg upgrade, X can also dash, possibly the most essential of the new movement options, as the additional speed gained also carries into your jumps and, weirdly, doubles the damage of your buster shot, although that second thing is very likely some sort of bug. With all these new capabilities came a new control scheme, taking full advantage of the SNES's controller layout. You can now quick change between special weapons with no need to enter the pause menu, which saves a lot of time by allowing you to cycle through your artillery on the fly. This may be a matter of taste, but I never stick with the default control scheme in this game. Having both dash and jump set to face buttons makes frequent dash jumps awkward and uncomfortable, and so I set dash to one of the shoulder buttons instead. Makes it so much easier. As a result, I move weapon switching to X and Y instead of L and R, and that's never given me any problems. The game also still uses password saves, which even in 1993 seemed a bit outdated but it's not like the game is super long, so I'm willing to overlook this here. X can also receive long-term upgrades hidden throughout the various stages. There's permanent health ups in the form of heart tanks, which is nice, but also new sub-tanks, which are basically refillable energy tanks, and this is such a cool idea. 
In the classic games, it was always just a little bit frustrating to see an enemy drop energy refills when you're already at full health, but now any energy you pick up while you're topped off will be deposited into your empty subtanks. Plus, now each subtank only needs to be found once, since using one merely empties it instead of removing it from your inventory entirely. This makes you less hesitant to use them in non-emergency situations, such as to top yourself off before a tough enemy or boss, since energy drops tend to be plentiful. There is also armor parts, such as the aforementioned buster and leg upgrades, but also an armor upgrade that cuts incoming damage in half, which is guarded by a mini-boss that is a huge damage sponge and takes far longer to beat than any other boss in the game. Seriously, what the hell is up with this thing? There's also a helmet upgrade that lets you break overhead blocks like your frickin' Mario. Certain stages also host ride armors, exosuits that you can pilot which absorb damage for X and can punch everything in sight. They can also be sacrificed to give X an additional jump, just like Yoshi. All the function without any of the guilt. Just like the classic series, there are eight main bosses to defeat, and each maverick is themed after some sort of flora or fauna as opposed to just a general concept like the classic Robot Masters. In this first entry in particular, a few of them even seem like remakes of Mega Man 1 bosses, right down to the weapons you gain from them. Chill Penguin is Iceman, Flame Mammoth is Fireman, Spark Mandrill is Elecman, and Boomer Kalanger is Cutman. With the addition of charged special weapons, every boss gives you more tools than ever before. And even if you miss the Buster upgrade in Flame Mammoth stage, Zero will give you his Z-Buster later on, which functions identically. What's more, bosses can be permanently crippled by exposure to the Boomerang Cutter. Flame Mammoth loses his trunk, and Launch Octopus will have his tentacles severed. Every weapon in this game is useful in some way or another, and they all feel fairly balanced, especially Storm Tornado and Homing Torpedo. Oh, I'm sorry, Horming Torpedo. Chameleon Sting deserves special mention again because even once you've used the charge version to become invincible, you can still fire regular shots. But honestly, if you want to go around and hit enemies with a sled made of ice carved to look like a penguin, you could do that too. Fuck, I love this game. After beating all eight Mavericks, you move on to Sigma's Fortress. And notably, it's not a gauntlet this time. The game gives you a new password between each stage and leaves you free to revisit other stages to refill subtanks and extra lives in between. And pro tip, the best place to do this is Armored Armadillo's stage. The bat enemies here are prone to dropping large energy refills, and one among them is actually a hidden batten enemy from the classic games, which drops a free extra life every time you defeat it. During the Sigma stages, you beat the eight stage bosses again just like the old games. Though much like the original Mega Man, the bosses are scattered throughout the stages instead of the capsule room that had become the standard. All the classic Mega Man ingredients are here, but in a whole new dish unlike any we'd tasted before. While you are encouraged to beat the Mavericks in weakness order like in any other Mega Man game, the game offers you several incentives to break away from that habit. First off, beating certain levels can affect other levels. For example, beating Chill Penguin will cause snow to cool the lava in Flame Mammoth stage, removing major hazards and freeing up the path to a heart tank. Beating Storm Eagle will cause his airship to crash into and cut off power throughout Spark Mandrill stage. And beating Launch Octopus will cause areas of Sting Chameleon stage to flood. This is such a great idea that hasn't really been explored to the same degree in later entries, and frankly I'm at a loss as to why. There are also certain upgrades that can only be accessed with certain weapons or abilities, meaning returning to old stages will sometimes be required to pick up items you couldn't get the first time. Older Mega Man games clearly had correct orders to tackle the stages, with the only real decision for the player being which boss on the weakness loop they should fight first. Here you can choose to follow weakness order as usual, or maybe instead choose to finish the stage that makes a later one easier, or even plan out a path that minimizes backtracking. Wh what's this? Depth? In a Mega Man game? Hold on, champ, that there is dangerous thinking. Unfortunately, there was one game design decision made that kind of throws a wrench into all of that. Locking the dash behind the leg upgrade really hurt things, as the dash is such an essential tool in tackling basically any stage of the game. The dash upgrade is in Chill Penguin's stage, and considering clearing that stage also makes Flame Mammoth stage easier, that makes Penguin stage the de facto first choice for almost any playthrough, regardless of which order you were planning to do. In every subsequent X game, dashing is a default mechanic. It's that integral to the gameplay. It's very evident that the team even knew how important the dash was. The leg upgrade is the only one that you can't miss. Even if you use a password to skip the leg armor upgrade, X will still have it in the ending sequence. 
Dash jumping and dash wall jumping opened so many mobility options for exploration and combat. It was such a refreshing change that also sped up the basic movement and flow of the game as a whole. And keeping that function hidden behind what's essentially a collectible was a bad move. There is also a secret endgame super weapon hidden in the game, only available once you collect every last upgrade. You can learn how to do the Hadouken from Street Fighter, with the proper button command and all, whenever X is at full health. And this attack can one-hit kill any enemy in the game aside from the final boss. I get that this is meant to be some super secret ultimate attack, but if you ask me, it's a bit too hidden. To organically discover this upgrade on your own, you would need to spontaneously decide to keep going through Armored Armadillo stage for no reason, to do a specific jump off a minecart near the end, and then kill yourself, repeating the process four times before the capsule appears. I'm lost as to how they expected anyone to learn about this in the days before the internet. The Hadouken also isn't preserved with passwords, so if you quit the game after this point, you'll have to go through that whole process again. The Hadouken does come with the only audible voice line in the game, though, because even X knows that announcing your special attack gives it more power. And because this is a new console, this means that the graphics and sound all got upgrades, and those 16-bit sprites reflect it. The new setting also provided an opportunity for new art direction, and Mega Man X definitely has a harder edge than the classic games. More Gundam than Astro Boy. Every music track in the game is amazing, with each piece distinct enough and frenetic enough to be burned into my eardrums. I will always remember songs like the intro stage, Spark Mandrill, Boomer Kawanger, and Storm Eagle. And Sigma is no slouch either, as his first encounter theme is almost non-stop beats, and it's quite catchy. You know, if you don't throw a Hadouken at him and end the fight immediately. Looking back, I can only imagine the reason the latter NES trilogy of Mega Man games were so cookie-cutter was because the bulk of the creativity and effort was going towards this one. And if that is why Mega Man 4 through 6 were so basic and bland, I don't want to say this was equivalent exchange, but I'll heavily imply it. The story and characters here are more developed, the world feels more flushed out, and the gameplay is the most fun I've ever had in this series, before or since. Everything feels so responsive and intuitive which honestly feels a bit unusual for Mega Man, no offense. There are a few technical issues, such as slowdown in a few spots, but this is the Mega Man of the future, the Mega Man we'd been waiting for, and the Mega Man Dr. Light and Keiji Inafune set out to give to the world. Mega Man X is the standard to which I hold every other Mega Man game and action platformers in general, and that's not an uncommon stance. Mega Man X was the breath of fresh air this franchise had so desperately needed and it proved that you can revitalize a long-running franchise without completely reinventing the core gameplay. It still ticked all the checkboxes, it just added and expanded on everything so much that it feels like a completely new experience. There's no reason not to give this game a shot, as it is, in my opinion, the pinnacle of Mega Man.